What's good? What's going on with y'all? Welcome to the Miseducation of the People podcast, episode two of season two, MOTP 202. You see see right there, you know, I got to break it down a little for you. Life is like a dice game. In this episode, I'm talking about grieving, the importance of thinking outside the box when you're trying to succeed, never saying no to opportunities, and an introduction to what esports is via a conversation with the phenomenal Jihan J, aka the hip hop tech diva. Beats by Pete Samples. Miseducation. Miseducation. Yo, what's good? What's good? I'm back. Just like some of y'all fellas' hairlines, they know you out there hat fishing, beloved. Go ahead, just shave it off, you know, ball, five, ball. We about to have intake coming, so make sure you join. But anyway, you know what time it is. It's time for the AKAs. It's your boy, the body god with the superbly supreme gleam, Now I mean? <laughs> Top two bodies, and I'm not number two. Certified body boy. Come on, man. Drake stole it for me. Stop, stop it, stop it. The smoothest body on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. That's right, both sides. Mr. Sweater God, because, you know, I got the sweaters out here. You know, I'm about to start pulling them out, even though it's hot in this office. So if y'all see me pull out the big boy sweat rag, you know, that's what it's for, you know. But anyway, uh, let me finish these AKAs real quick before we get into it, you know. Baldy so smooth, I can't believe it's not butter. Your favorite fly, bald professor, Taryn Morgan II. What's good? What's going on with y'all? Welcome to the Miseducation of the People podcast. New Miseducation. Episode 2 of Season 2, MOTP 202. You see, you see right there, you know, I got to break it down a little for you. Life is like a dice game. In this episode, I'm talking about grieving, the importance of thinking outside the box when you're trying to succeed, never saying no to opportunities, and an introduction to what esports is via a conversation with the phenomenal Jihan J, aka the hip hop tech diva. But before we get into that, you know, we got to shout out the people out here, you know, like we, we everyday people, like John Levin said, so we deserve some kind of, you know, recognition for what we're doing out here. But shout out to the people that scrub the crack off the side of their the nose, you know, it be looking a little crusty, dusty, some people, you know, so make sure, you know, we take that washcloth, just give a little, little rinse right there, get the behind the ears too, you know, some, some of y'all nasty, but you know, I ain't gonna put you on blast out here. Shout out to my people who only put lotion on the visible parts of their body when they're going down public. You ain't low. It's, it's all good, though. You know, when, when, it, when the shirt come up a little too high, you see the little ash mark. It's all good, though. You know, ain't no judgment, but it's some judgment anyway. And lastly, shout out to all the amazing women out there. Happy Women's History Month. And this episode definitely is uh, in, in par with that, with our guests, you know, but we want to talk about that later on. So I'm going to break down what the title means to me of this episode. Life is like a dice game. This song is inspired by Nas, which features Corday and Freddie Gibbs. And before we really get into it, um, sometimes life doesn't go planned. You know, we have uh, our goals in life, all that good stuff. But, you know, simply it's not our fault, but it just happens. And one thing I love, um, shout out to a former college football star and motivational speaker, Inky Johnson. It's a quote that he said that really um, helped me process what was going on in my life the past couple of years. So he stated, people change so you can learn to let go. Things go wrong so you can learn to appreciate when it's right. Sometimes things fall apart so better things can fall together. And that's really has been the story of my life going through this, this hectic journey. Um, so before we really get into the meat of things, I know you're probably wondering, where you, where were you at? You said you coming back bi-weekly. Things happen, you know? So, um, my grandfather, he passed, uh, 93 years old. Um, so I was dealing with all of that in the beginning of January. So it literally dropped the first episode and boom, all that stuff happened. Um, so first off, rest in peace to my grandfather, Frederick Good Senior. Thank you for your service. Appreciate you 1000%. But in my time where I was um, MIA, we were cleaning out the house, you know, 60 years worth of crap <laughs> all over the house. Um, but it really got me a chance to learn more about my family, about him and everything. So my grandfather, he's the man that taught me how to fix and build things. We was out here building decks together, um, doing construction on houses, all that good stuff. So he taught me how to use tools, taught me how to bowl and he's the reason why I talk fast and mumble sometimes. So if y'all notice it, you know, it's because I've been around him a lot. Um, when I was a kid, I used to go to my grandparents' house and they used to watch me while my parents were working. So, you know, spent a lot of time. 
He definitely made a unique impact on this world. He was a Montford Point Marine, which are the first black men who are allowed to, by law, to serve in the Marines. So he fought for the right to fight. So y'all Marines now, you're welcome, because that's what my grandfather did. He was one of the first people to break that barrier, along with the other men around that time, too. Um, he was awarded by Obama the Congressional Medal. And just hearing about all the amazing things that he accomplished throughout his life, especially in his tenure as, in the military, that man has so many awards um, and designations I never knew. Um, and then even seeing what he did in the community all throughout life, um, just through service and his just being who he is. So, you know, definitely it was a hard loss, but, um, you know, it's a part of life. And I understand I accept death for what it is, you know, something we can't change. Change is the only thing that is consistent in this life. But um, grieving, that's something that was very different for me this time around. Um, as I've been doing the work to heal, um, to feel your emotions is to be human, contrary to what society tells us. You know, at mostly times as men, we're conditioned to think that, oh, showing emotions or feeling your emotions are a sign of weakness when it's really not. Having vulnerability, having vulnerability, I cannot speak right now, I told you, uh, is the key to strength. Being able to open up and talk about what's going on with you, not just keeping it in. And in the past, I would suppress crying because of that conditioning. Um, I wouldn't cry for months, years, sometimes not, not a fact. Um, and it actually hurt physically for me to cry because all the years of just holding it in. But um, it, it was just different, you know. Now I let it flow and I don't care who's around. Before I used to hide if I cried or whatever and I wouldn't admit it. But, you know, it's a part of life. That's to be emotionally human again. When you subscribe to the conditioning of the masses that men don't cry, grieving still occurs in some way, some form. We just don't realize it or expect it. Um, for some, and me in the past, it came out as anger. And when I say like I was angry, I never really verbally expressed it or let it out. But it was in my mind, in my body, and I really felt it. And it was like an uncomfortable condition because you're trapped within your mind with this this, this, this emotion and this tension, and it's not a good thing, you know, it's denying the fact that something is no longer with you. That was something that was an issue. Um, and that happened for me when I was suppressing my emotions. Um, and in order to heal from anything, you have to go through it. Like Jay-Z said on 444, you can never heal what you never reveal. You have to really sit in that, that issue, that thing that's bothering you. You have to really process it look at it in the face don't use substances to distract yourself to escape from the reality of what it is because by avoiding it you're not making it better it's just going to build up and build up i look at it as like a um tea kettle it just over time gets hotter 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 and then eventually it just spills all over the place and just like with um suppressing emotion it will come out somehow and it will manifest in your body as physical illness too um, I know when I wasn't taking care of myself, uh, I had a lot of issues like with stress holding in my shoulder. I had ringing in my ears. I had pain over my heart, um, high blood pressure, mental illness, disease, cancer, etc. That's why it's very, very important to have positive coping strategies to let all this out. Self-care does matter. And self-care doesn't mean treating yourself retail therapy. It can be a walk. It can be going back to something you did as a child. It could be, you know, just reading things that'll let you burn that stress off. Um, for me, I enjoy working out because it helps me get that pain out, that that aggression, that those emotions that I can't really process uh, or I'm processing, but it's just too much for me to hold in. Um, and I make sure that when I'm in my self-care mode, that I'm putting myself first. Um, I know when to say no, when to uh, exercise my boundaries, when to, you know, just really pour into others. Like I always say that you should never be pouring from your cup. You should be pouring from the overflow of your cup because you don't want to deplete it. You cannot show it for anyone else if you are not whole for yourself. And um, I am a uh, advocate of medical cannabis. Um, it's a natural plant. It has no side effects and it provides multiple benefits to us. However, 
it is an addictive substance of substance. And um, some people don't realize it because, you know, it is a plant and whatnot, but you can literally get addicted to anything. Caffeine, sugar, um, chocolate. A lot of people are, allergic, uh, are addicted to chocolate and whatnot. And um, when it comes to grieving, a lot of times people abuse it because it helps them to escape the reality that they are facing. And that escapism isn't really good. And with this period of grieving for myself, um, I am a medical cannabis patient. Um, I made sure that I was conscious of how I was using the plant because I wanted to make sure that I was processing the grief, the loss of my grandfather and just other things that I've lost in my life too. Cause I wasn't just grieving my grandfather. There's a ton, ton of things going on in my life that, you know, I don't put out there or talk to people about, but you know, it's a part of life, but masking the pain does not help. It only makes it worse. Definitely. And another symptom of grieving that I, um, have dealt with in the past was withdrawing from the world and family. Um, I know when my grandmother passed in uh, years ago, it's probably like over 10 years now, it took a while for me to come back to the house because I witnessed her dead on the ground being resuscitated. And that was it's still in my mind. And it took me a while to even sit in her chair and whatnot. So grieving can be you just going into your shell and just being to yourself, a hermit or whatever, you know, um, or it can be going mute, not talking about what's going on with yourself. That is a trauma response that some people have and they go back to it automatically when they're in that space. Um, you know, you have some inner child healing to do when you react just like you did as a child to certain things that you're faced with different adversity adversaries. You know, I can't speak, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, losing people is tough, but we have to start building an intentional time to start healing ourselves. And I know for me, before my grandfather, both my grandfathers passed, um, I was very intentional about spending time with them while they were still here, here on this earth. I do believe that they're still here with me spiritually, but on this earth, those last moments, that's very important, you know? And we talked about a lot of stuff from like his childhood um, stuff that, you know, I wanted to know about. So that was very good for me to really just have that last moment of connection. And that helped to me start the grieving process because I already knew what it was. But what helped me out really big time was even cleaning out the house. Um, I had an aunt and uncle that passed many years. So seeing their stuff like in their pictures, pictures speak a thousand words and you see the different personalities. I'm like, my family lived. We was out here partying and all that stuff and just having a good time with like what we had and all that good stuff. Um, I never got to see that personality, that side of them as a child. Cause I didn't understand it. And I wasn't in that mindset. I, I, th I thought as a child, I lived as a child, you know, but it showed that human side of things th that side of them when they were my age right now. So that was dope to see, you know, and made me really uh, proud of where I came from. And this period really made me reflect on my life and what my legacy is going to be. Just thinking about everything that my grandfather said, um, had, had did throughout his life. Um, I know I make it look like my life is put together, but it's still a work in progress, you know, but I'm not where I was in the past, but I'm not where I want to be yet, but I enjoy being in the present. However, life has been harder than genuine saying so <laughs> and so anxious. <laughs> So one of my quotes by Mike Tyson is everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I've gotten punched in my face by life a lot, not physically by anybody else, but life in general. Um, I've had a lot of plans that I made that God laughed at. Um, and I had a lot of things that were, I was taught to do past to go down. And when I tried it, I got kept getting punched. I kept getting punched and it wasn't until I got tired of losing and get punched in my face that I learned the rhythm of the punch, AKA adapting to what comes to you in life, pivoting, adjusting. So once I learned the rhythm of the punch, I learned how to block. Now I took a couple of classes in boxing, but you know, like I was kind of nice with it, but I never really advanced, but I know some basics, you know? So when you learn how to bot block, the next step, is learning how to slip the punch. So you get, they, they, 
trying to hit you over here. Slip. So that's something right there. Boom. Block. You slip. And it's a process. You learn these things step by step, the fundamentals. Next step, you know, you're learning the rhythm of punch even better. So you block, slip, roll. Hit him with the uh, counter jump right there, right? So with that, it's all about adjusting, pivoting and adjusting, taking those life challenges, those struggles, finding the lesson within it and using it to grow and evolve. That's the purpose of life. That's what I see the purpose of life is, especially for me. Learning to defend yourself in boxing is very similar to life. The only thing you can count on in life that is very consistent is change. And throughout my life, I've struggled with uh, the, the process of adjusting to change because I always wanted to control the outcomes. Um, I had control issues, not necessarily like in relationships, but like with where my path was going in life when it came to career, because that's always been one of my biggest downfalls. I wasn't really getting what I, I the value that I bring. I wasn't getting it back monetarily. Um, I was getting recognition wise, but I wasn't speaking up for myself because I was going off of past things that I was taught that are no longer valid to survive. Um, and once I realized that I don't have control and I just needed to surrender what was going on and pivot and adjust to the things that I was met with, that's when the magic began to happen. So I've spoken about this many, many times, the struggle that I had of finding a job despite having two master's degrees and applying to over 100 jobs back in 2018. So I remember during that time just really being extremely angry and begging to God and my ancestors, spare guides, sounding like the legendary Ice J.J. Fish. Give me a chance, give me a chance. Give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance. Yo, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance. Give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance. And they heard me and they said bet in the respective way. A dream is God's promise. And when you first start your calling, it may it may look and sound crazy to everybody, you know, but it's okay. Because it was not a conference call. It was your personal mission that was instilled to you by God. Um, when I started my dream of Real Talk Session Series, a lot of people looked at me crazy. They're like, okay, mm-hmm, yeah. But I kept going. Um, and even in the beginning, like when I was dealing with a lot of mania, um, I was sending emails to some very, very powerful people, <laughs> like black people, successful people. Um, and I was getting responses I was getting follows, but I wasn't ready for it. Um, I was trying to skip the steps to get to the top of the mountain, but I didn't realize that the journey to the top is the most important part of the trek to success. I needed to learn things along the line that will help me out later on down the line once I got more further in my journey. It required resilience and discipline. And my journey Everything I thought were setbacks, it prepared me for what I'm doing today. And I had no idea what I would go through and how long it would take, but I just kept pushing. Um, you can only think to the level of which you are exposed to. Um, I knew I wanted to make an impact on kids, but I didn't know how um, I wanted to do that because I, I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, I wasn't going back to school. <laughs> not, not at all. However, um, I had no plans of how I can do this in my own unique way outside of being an educator. Um, but being diagnosed with mental illness, it allowed for me to connect with an audience that I never thought I would be able to help in my own unique way um, by just sharing my story and how I got through it. And when I took a hiatus from higher education in 2019 and couldn't find a job, despite reaching out to people who said they got me, I turned to what I knew, which was working with my hands. Um, I come from a family where doing manual labor is our usual form of work. You know, um, one thing I've been doing in particular is landscaping all my life. Um, when I was a kid, I had a few yards that I used to cut, pushing lawn more around town. And I was making money that way, you know, I had money to do whatever I wanted to that way. Um, but this this summer when I couldn't find a job, I had to go back to my roots and doing landscaping in the hot ass summer heat. So um, it, it wasn't 
I didn't complain because I know that I can make it happen with me putting in work. And at the time, and I still am working out, but I was, it kept me in shape and it kept me hungry for more because it was just the hard labor and it allowed for me to tap back into my inner teenager. So that's something I haven't talked about yet, but we talk about the inner child, but the inner teenager is someone that really needed the support also. I know for me, I was a very uh, insecure teenager, didn't fit in, just awkward and whatnot. And then when I hit um, junior year, that's when the glow up happened, you know, and all this stuff. But like, it was it was real, you know. Um, but me doing landscaping allowed for me to go back to that time as a teenager and to give that support that I, that I needed. Um, I actually liked cutting grass back then. Um, it allowed for me to zone out and be with my thoughts. And um, the thing was, this time around, instead of cutting grass, we were laying over about two thousand uh, pounds of sod a day. So landscaping got very old very fast, and that's when I turned to the internet because I have bigger goals in my life. I have no issues with anyone that does landscaping, but I know for me, it just was something that was did not allow for me to give a return on my investment. So I knew I had to do something different in order to get a different result. And that's when I turned to the internet for help. So I saw the success of people um, using the internet to solicit help when they're looking for jobs and whatnot. Um, I never did though, but at the time I was desperate and I needed it. And that's when two very special people came to my assistance. Um, Miss Ty Gibbs and Miss Vicky Fernandez. Shout out to y'all. Thank you so much. Um, they plugged me in for operations positions at a nonprofit and then working at an after school program for the 13th elementary uh, school in Newark, New Jersey. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to y'all. My time at the nonprofit didn't last long, but it was a test to see if I learned my lesson about the boundaries and demanding my respect. Um, I passed it with flying colors because the CEO tried to play me, but she didn't realize she was really playing herself. And I walked out of that job with no notice at all because disrespect, I don't tolerate that no more. So that was something right there that um, that experience, even though it was short lived, it allowed for me to gain more operations experience on a, a larger scale um, and just in a different capacity that helped me out later on down in life today. Um, 13th Avenue School it allowed me the firsthand experience to see the conditions that students are dealing with and hearing some of the conditions that they're dealing with at home also and family. Um, I saw the lack of resources within the school to assist students, but it allowed for me to see how to possibly fill the voids that students had to assist them to be successful. Um, during that time also, um, I was intentional about working on my skill set and networking. So I filled my time with volunteering for the Monmouth County Cotillion and National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, the Monmouth County Cotillion allowed for me to work on my, um, my uh, social media marketing skills and then also my, my tech skills. I've always been good with tech, but really just IT support and whatnot. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness allowed for me to sharpen my public speaking. And also I ran their social media marketing also. Um, so these allowed for me to get the receipts I needed to evolve and grow and to, you know, get the jobs that I deserved. Fast forward today, where I am now a third generational coach for an esports program that I personally built from the mud and that won two championships in the first season while creating a game development academic curriculum at the same time. Greatness is in my blood. My grandfather and my father, they coached football, basketball, baseball, and provided positive male uh, guidance to the youth in the community. However, my journey into esports started as a kid, just playing for fun. My family is very big on video games, but it was just viewed as a waste of time. My personal favorites were Zelda and Final Fantasy, but Mortal Kombat, Puffy. Death Jam, Vendetta, Crazy Taxi, Ready to Rumble, Madden and basketball games were also heavy played by myself and my family too. Um, my little brother actually used to cheat all the time when it came to the video games. He used to put the settings up and I didn't know that. I used to kill him all the time and like I think it was a Madden or it was uh, one of the NBA games. And one day he was just destroying me. I looked at the settings. He, he was cheating. 
<laughs> but anyway, but um, we used to do Madden tournaments back in high school, actually. Um, we used to lug them big behind tube TVs to one of my friend's house, have about like five, six TVs at a time, people playing back and forth. And I was nice at Madden 05 with the Mike Vick cover, too. So that's the year I was whipping everybody behind, you know. So if y'all want to run it back, we can, and I can gracefully pass you that L, you know, just let me know. But that was something right there. That was esports. We were competing right then and there, but we didn't realize what it was. This was back in, like, 2004. So looking at it now, I'm like, okay, this, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing, you know. But then... During college, that's when um, I wasn't really as heavy on video games, but um, I got put onto Call of Duty by one of my exes. Shout out to you, Brittany. What's good? What's good? Um, and I was on there. I had a good little run on it. It was nice. But once I graduated college, uh, undergrad, I rarely played. And if I did, it was like a Batman or a Spider-Man game, but it wasn't hours of playing like I used to do in the past. And I still play video games today, but I don't spend many hours really playing like that. Um, but what really got me into the esports field was the pandemic. So, um, I worked for Morgan State University, um, and I, my role is digital engagement. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were looking for ways to engage our students digitally. And that's when I ran across a Call of Duty tournament that was put together by 300 Entertainment, DTLR, and Community. And shout out to all y'all because y'all have played a big role in gaming here right now. Um, and with that, I found the opportunity. I put the team together in a week and we won the whole thing. The first showing, we were the underdogs. So that's that moment that sparked because I tried something new. And it showed me the potential that esports had for me. And that momentum allowed for me to build a program from scratch. That moment also allowed for me to be selected for the MEAC Conference Esports Board and being nominated for the marketing and corporate sponsorship chairman position. Um, then fast forward a few more months, less than six months of me being in the esports space, I was able to secure a $200,000 donation from Verizon to build an esports lab and to distribute five $20,000 scholarships to students in STEM. And a year exactly from when I got into esports, that was October, 2021, I was able to produce a event for the MEAC that featured Corday on campus, giving a sneak preview of his latest album from a bird's eye view. And he played one of my athletes in NBA 2K. On behalf of Morgan State University, the esports program, the MEAC, like a housing of, of student-like development, SGA, Mr. and Mrs. Morgan Court, my boss, a lot of words right now. Good. But we want to present you with a gift. Follow up. <laughs> Corday, the album was nice, but in, in NBA 2K, he took the L. You know, we, we had to give it to him. You know, he came in the yard, so, you know, we had to politely head past that L. But, you know, if you want to replay, rematch, let me know. We can run it back. Um, then this past uh, semester two, where we had Corday, we had our first official season with 70 students signed up on a roster in less than two months. So that opportunity allowed for us to get our notoriety going around the country. So we were invited to national panels, um, killing the competition. Um, we were the inaugural MEAC Splitgate champions and won the McDonald's HBCU Network Rocket League Championship. And recently, I produced the first ever live interactive broadcast for the MEAC and Morgan State University as a part of the NBA All-Star Weekend HBCU Challenge when we faced Howard University. And... All of this happened because I stepped out of my comfort zone. I never expect this ever to happen to me. Um, I never thought that I would be working in video games and technology, but here I am. And all of that past volunteer experience, all the jobs, it prepared me for this period in my life. And I would say definitely to anyone who's looking to evolve or tired of being stagnant in their life, losing whatever, et cetera, whatever you may be going through to not say no to any opportunity that comes before you due to fear or because you feel that you're not experienced or qualified enough to handle responsibility. You know, I, I used to avoid the hard things, you know, that I knew would make me better in the end, but it was just that anxiety, that, that fear of what happens if this works or whatever or what not. I didn't really trust in myself. But now I'm elevating this to new levels, cutting out excuses, 
and knocking out challenges in life like the one hitter quitter guy Jason Derulo when you anyone mistakes him for Bitch, Usher. I got it out the muscle. You wanna fight on toss? Uh, I'm talking about. Mm. Never give up on your willingness to learn. Education goes beyond the traditional schooling. You don't need a college degree. You can get search. You can work for tech companies now without a college degree. Like it's a different world. With YouTube and the internet, you can literally learn how to do anything and be successful, except for hard search. You don't be out here or giving them uh, them BBLs in the back room with the call core, putting them braces on. I see y'all out here moving funny. Y'all, y'all, y'all weird. But any, anyway, but definitely use social media, the internet as a tool to connect it with people, organizations and respective fields that you want to get into or thinking of um, a random DM can turn into something bigger an opportunity. Um, don't take those random ideas that pop up in your mind for granted. These were given to you by God, your ancestors, spirit guides, the universe actually explore them. You never know what they may grow into. It's just like a seed that you put into the ground with care and maintenance. It will grow into something that will be great and pr produce something that will allow for you to survive on your own and to live life on your own terms. I had no clue what I was doing and still don't at times, but that's the beautiful thing about esports. It's new enough that there is no right or wrong way. And that's fine by me because I like figuring stuff out on my own and starting my own, own ways with stuff. And once I realized this and I got past that imposter syndrome phase, I took off, off, like off, off. And now this is how I am every time the blessings flow in because I put that work in. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. All right, so progress report of what's going on here at the Real Talk Session Series. Merch is currently on hold. My vendor went out of business, unfortunately. So if you know of any reliable Black-owned merchandise companies, please send them my way. Please email me at taren at realtalksessionseries.org. Now, outside of that, you know, support the crew support the org support the movement follow us on instagram facebook youtube at real talk session series and shout out to y'all on youtube land 500 subscribers we cannot do this without y'all thank you so much for the support let's continue to move this forward continue to pass this along to your people we are out here spreading this education for free and we are trying to just bring generational wealth to everybody just by spreading the information so please 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 pass it along to your peoples and you know let's get it going all right all right so it's time to get into our guest which is just in time for women's history month our guest miss jihan J, aka the hip-hop tech diva will be the first ever black woman to earn a phd in informatics with a focus on hci so that means Human Computer Interaction in Gaming and Esports from the University of California, Irvine. She out here killing the game, for real, for real. And when I talk about using the internet, social media to connect with people, this is exactly what I mean. Um, I've never actually physically met Jihan, but she has been a blessing in many ways. And it's those people that, you know, are, who are coming into my life who are put there on purpose. And I'm realizing that. And I definitely, you know, Thank you, Jihan, because you have definitely opened up some doors for me and have connected me with some people. But she is doing amazing work. Um, so I'm going to stop, you know, bigger up like that. We're going to bigger up in the interview. So let's go ahead and get into it. You was good, Jihan. How you doing today? What's popping? Nothing much at all. Appreciate you for coming on to the Education to People. Uh, before we start, I definitely got to show love, give you your flowers like Nori says, you know, uh, because you've definitely uh, been a great resource and asset and have opened your arms to me, you know, definitely. I'm new, the new kid on the block when it comes to esports stuff, so definitely salute you, I appreciate too, you. I so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I feel you, but like, it's definitely been nothing but love, so salute to you for real, for real. So, I know you a little bit. The people don't know you. So, who is Jihan and what do you do? All right, that's the million dollar question that a million people want to know. I am in a mom, I'm just a mom, but 
Okay, I'm a mom okay. for the people. Uh, I am an esports awareness advocate. I have a company, Tyo Robotics, that my 13 year old son and I own. Uh, oh. He's my business partner and founder. And it's the importance of spreading educational information and just awareness uh, on the importance of gaming and esports in marginalized communities um, so that they can understand the importance of the metaverse when it comes to gaming and esports. And the mm -hmm. STEM, um, the STEM or STEAM component that is geared with esports and gaming, because a lot of people in the our, our community are look at gaming as a negative condensation, and that it's not possible. Mm -hmm. But we really need to understand that gaming can actually take our kids so far with the implementation of being doctors, being lawyers, being podcast hosts, being content creators. Um, and so it's important just as a former educator that I am able to level both the educational side of it and speak to it in Lehman's term to educators on why esports and gaming can help mitigate the academic opportunity gap for black kids and brown kids um, so that we can be up to date for our people. Yeah, you definitely do are, are doing very important work for real for real because Coming up, we told that it's a waste of time. Um, particularly, I remember my grandmother like, "Take that thing off my TV before you break it." Like it was that whole thing, you know. But like now, we're seeing it today. It's a billion dollar, multi billion dollar industry, and it's it only is. growing. It's, it's a hundred, and here in the states, it's a hundred. I think forty seven billion internationally. It's mark priced at a hundred and ninety seven billion. So I'll give you some stats real quick. I hit them with the stats, hit them with the stats. Right, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Listen, billion dollar industry, 87% um, of black kids gain daily, uh, but 2% of us are in this industry. So that is just a level and just a visual for people to understand why gaming is important. So mm -hmm. I'll let you kick to the questions and then that way I'll be able to go into deeper um, on the importance of esports and gaming education. Um, and I want the different levels that fall under it. Okay. Well, before we get there, I'm always about showing people the progression of how people got to a certain point. You know, um, this is an educational platform. So I like to get people resources on how they can make moves strategically to just get to other areas they never thought they would be. So before esports, like what did you start off doing? Because that's always important. Oh, I ain't started here. So, <laughs> so I'm curious to um, see how you started. I started out at 14 in radio, uh, broadcast journalism. I worked at a mainstream radio place. I grew up in the industry, so I always mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to have my hand in the industry, but I didn't want to follow my uncle's footsteps. I wanted to create my own. So did mm -hmm. radio from 14 to 22, majored at St. Aug, shout out to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. um, majored and got my degree in mass comm with a focus in broadcast journalism. Um, and public relations. Did mm. not know what the hell I wanted to do. I just knew I was going to be on TV. Somebody's going to see my face. <laughs> but then I ended up getting pregnant. And so my mom mm. was like, yo, you got to find something that is going to give you the flexibility as a single mom. I'm fresh out of college. So mm. took a year off to figure my life out. And then I went and um, got into education by teaching radio, radio at, at mm. high school kids. Um, I started off first of all, that was before I dipped in education. I was at Princeton Review and that gave me a look into education. I've never wanted to be around kids or nothing like that, <laughs> but something in my heart always brought the troubled kids back to me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started out as a broadcast journalism, a radio teacher at Richard Wright Public Charter School in Southeast, South Southeast, <laughs> Southeast DC. Um, and Dr. Margot Clark gave me a chance. And I walked in for an interview as a radio teacher, walked out as a reading teacher because I was a, had a, a funny way of connecting with kids. Mm -hmm. um, did education for about, man, 15 years. I went from eighth grade reading teacher to a journalism high school teacher all at like 25. Mm. Um, and then I was like, yo, I'm good at this shit. I'm gonna go get my master's. So I got mm. my master's um, in educational leadership. Um, and then I started out, I thought I wanted to be in higher ed. And so I went and did academia um, 
at Emory University. I was a professor assistant. Hated it. Um, but I learned a lot. Learned a lot. Um, and then I went back to schools and I taught at an all girls school as a special ed teacher. Uh, worked my way up within a couple months as the 504 plan coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, then assistant principal the following year. And I got teacher. Of the year right. year. So I was check you out. Check you out. I, I had a, a principal, Chaz Patterson, who will ever hold a place in my heart, and Marco mm -hmm. Clark, um, who guided me into the direction and saw some things in me. And so I had was able to use gaming because I was known as the hip hop educator, you know? I wanted mm -hmm. to go around and use hip hop for everything, but I saw that a lot of my kids like gaming. A lot of my kids just were in love with tech and I needed to figure out a way how to infuse that together with their learning processes because it helped with their cognitive behavior. Um, mm -hmm. It helped with their cognitive abilities as well. Um, so I was able to use gaming and then years of being an assistant principal, um, I, I finally said peace to the classroom and, and went to, <laughs> Um, worked at Microsoft, educate for Microsoft Education. I was a facilitator for two and a half, for about two years in Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I was really, really immersed into tech. I was immersed in AR, I was immersed in VR. Um, but then I really, really uh, had a conversation with the world, world president of education, Anthony. Um, mm -hmm. And I was telling him that my son wanted to be a professional gamer. My son was like, I want a game. I want to build a gaming thing. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but I knew that gaming helped kids, so I wasn't closed-minded about it. Um, mm -hmm. He told me, listen, your son could go to school for free. I'll never forget this. This was January 2019. Your son could mm -hmm. go to college for free. Uh, we we're in Seattle at the Microsoft building. He was like, this is what's about to take over. And so I started educating in myself on virtual reality. And as a facilitator for Microsoft Education, we had to become certified in Minecraft. And so all of my trainings would be Minecraft trainings. And then I would int be introduced to people all over the state of Georgia or just mm -hmm. in our cohort in Microsoft Education that were using gaming to close gaps and to reach students and reach communities. And I started out at Morehouse College for uh, care movement in the summertime for Susan Taylor's company, the one from Essence, her nonprofit. Mm. I was teaching reality application, building summer courses to inner city kids at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, that led me to <clears throat> really seeing the endless capabilities that students had when you gave them two directions. One, be creative. Two, use your imagination. Well, actually, I gave them three. Um, work as a great team leader. Mm -hmm. And so when I did that, I was able to see kids from all different um, academic levels succeed and build something that they want to. And that was building a virtual reality application, but using gaming as an initiative. And they were mm -hmm. they created their marketing plans. They created their, their characters. They used Paint 3D. They used a little bit of free resources that they had to bring their imagination to reality. And that's mm -hmm. when I knew it was it. Um, so I started looking at all the different things that I was doing over time from using gaming with specifically special needs students, understanding data um, from special needs, but then seeing the passion that my son had for gaming. But one of the biggest things was being at Woodward Academy in Atlanta, Georgia, and seeing all of these esports teams from private schools ha going at it, having competitions, learning that Woodward established. Mm -hmm. Georgia's first varsity high school team. Um, but around the corner from Woodward was Tri-Cities High School, where mm -hmm. kids, it, it's a performing arts high school, it's where Candy and Tiny from Escape graduated, Tyler Perry mm -hmm. donated money. Um, so seeing a performing arts school like that, not having access to the same school that was literally within their backyard really bothered me. And so mm -hmm. when, I, when I would mention esports, when I would mention <laughs> gaming, um, they would be like, well, what is that? Like the simple ability of just not knowing exactly what the definition of esports was bothered me. And knowing that they were in a district that actually had esports in the northern part of the district really bothered my soul. So I took it upon myself to create an awareness company um, 
because I've also had interactions with parents that told turn their nose up at gaming. And so I have to create the logic and this visual to show them why gaming is a, not negative. So that's mm -hmm. what led to gaming and esports. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't have nothing better to do with myself. It's a pandemic. I'm teaching myself UX design. If mm -hmm. I really want to talk about making a difference in technology, education, and esports and gaming, why not do it on a different level? So I enrolled at University of California at, at Irvine to get my PhD in informatics with mm -hmm. a focus on esports and gaming uh, for underserved communities and HBCUs. And I'm the first woman of color and first black woman to do this. I, I so, see why hey, Queen talk this talk, you know? I got to make a difference for my people because I've Facts. actually been in the field of seeing what happens when you use gaming to help with academics um, and, and our people being so far behind on this digital divide, how we can closely move those levels and that data progresses together so that we can catch up with our people around us. And so our people really, really need to be educated on the importance of gaming and esports and how we can use that to mitigate the academic opportunity gaps mm -hmm. um, for underserved communities, specifically black and brown and HBCUs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's re a reason why I'm here. That's definitely an amazing journey. And it fits the title perfectly for this episode, Life is Like a Dice Game. So for people who are out there, I'm sure I'm not sure if you've seen it before, but I name all my shows after songs that are out there, like the kind of the okay. vibe. So now it's life is like a dice game, you know, and it shows that that serendipity of life, you know, different circumstances have led you different ways and it connected little by little. And my story is very similar to that, too. Um, so definitely salute to you for real, because we don't. Most people, when it comes to gaming, they're introduced to it. You know, they don't take it seriously, but they don't have an open mind to the different possibilities right. that it leads to. You know, there's different avenues that you can get into. You know, like when I think about what you were talking about earlier with Minecraft, I'm like, I learned about the educational benefits of different games and whatnot. But can you actually go into that a little bit more? Because parents don't understand yeah. that. These games like Minecraft, Among Us, uh, Assassin's Creed, they have educational Roblox. benefits to them. Roblox, yes. So please, like, talk about some of the benefits that these different titles offer to students developmentally when it comes to socially, ec educational, everything. So, you know, yeah, talk on so, that a little bit, please. Oh, man, I'm going to touch on Minecraft because there are so many abilities that Minecraft does to reach the community. So we mm -hmm. think of Minecraft as just this blocks of games of kids building these things, but it's teaching mm -hmm. um, architectural structure, it's teaching design mechanism, it's teaching design thinking, computational thinking, um, but then it also touches on algebra, calculus. Um, it has these different um, lessons embedded into it so that students, particularly kids, can figure out an alternative way for their learning processes. Uh, mm -hmm. I have Minecraft uh, ch teacher challenge cards, um, and they have different essential questions on them for students to answer, um, but it also helps with collaboration, communication, critical thinking skills, and also mm -hmm. just building community. And so when you're able to implement these uh, type of structures, specifically specifically Minecraft, it mm -hmm. helps with building real life scenarios. And so you're able to take, let's say for instance, teachers, any educators listening, this is an educational show. Um, you can mm -hmm. use Minecraft to teach your lessons. Um, and so for instance, if you want to do a lesson on black history or civil rights, there are actually lessons pre-made um, in Minecraft to teach that. It comes with questions, it comes with um, activities. Uh, and mm -hmm. so you're able to go in there and build uh, maybe a setting. So let's say, um, what's a good, uh, my son just watched. It's the, the, the movie with, the play with Diddy. Um, it was Diddy, Felicia Rashad. What, what was that movie? Oh, I know what you're talking about. It, was, you know it came I'm out a while talking. ago. Yeah, it came out a while right. ago. Right, it was the Broadway play. So, for instance, if I really wanted to teach kids about the history of Black history and Black authors, I would have them build a scene out of that in Minecraft and then mm. ask them questions. Um, and then that's when it, it, it eases away from teaching and actually goes to facilitation because we want to get in the mindset of facilitating our kids. Mm. 
because our kids and data shows that kids learn better from their peers. So if we can facilitate the instruction um, by allowing our kids to have their freedom and their ability to learn on their own, it will take us farther. And so Minecraft is one of those, those educational games and educational resources that can allow that. Think mm. about it, and I, and I have this scenario that I use whenever I'm doing facilitation is I also use hip hop because I am the hip hop tech diva. Oh, we're going to so get there. We're going to get there. Called, uh, <laughs> I have one call. You could get with this and you could get with that. Okay. And okay. so it's the, it's the, the old school versus new school versus a video gaming. And it's mm -hmm. really a, a sit down mind thinking exercise that I make parents and educators do to let them understand that we are all gamers. We are game designers of life, but we have all played some type of game in our lives. And the mm -hmm. only thing that's different is that our children have more advanced technology than we ever did. So a matter of fact, I posted it on social media the other day and people went crazy Oregon Trail. And so I always start yeah. off with, <laughs> yo, how many of y'all used to go in the computer lab at school and play Oregon Trail? You're going to see everybody's hand raised. And I'm mm -hmm. like, remember how we used to get crowded around the computers? Or our teacher would tell us we had five minutes to complete this <laughs> method, then we have to go to the next one. That was, edu that was gamification. That was educational technology. That was gaming education. Mm -hmm. And then I get on Corner Store. I'm from Philly. So we used to always have to go okay. to the Corner Store to play Pac-Man. We also always have to go to the corner store to play Mortal Kombat or mm. we would go play in a skating rink. That was our way of communicating with our friends because we all huddled up together at one arcade machine to mm. play. Now, our kids in, in the 21st century, all they do is they had their friends online. Instead of kids asking for money, like we used to ask our parents, dig in their change machines to go play video <laughs> games with our friends. They now get to sit at it with the luxury of being at home. They get to sit and ha do it their way by subscribing to a membership, but meeting mm -hmm. friends from all over the world, um, but learning. And then it brings different cultural experiences in there. Um, you can learn different languages because you will make friends that, you know, are, are from different areas of the world. And you, you want to learn about their culture is totally different. Everybody is a gamer, and so gaming is universal, but gaming is also educational as well. Yes, 1,000%. And the one thing I really appreciate by, about gaming, especially when it comes to online, you're able to connect, but for people who are introverted, you know, it's excellent for them to be able to get socialization and to really meet new people and engage with people they normally wouldn't at all, you know? So it's definitely amazing for that aspect. But I'm, I'm always a fan of talking about both sides of the coin, right? So what are some like of the negatives of gaming in general when it comes for students, for women, all that stuff? Um, just the bias that's out there. It, it's a predominantly mm -hmm. white ran um, industry. And so we're trying to change the mindsets and the thought process of the hierarchy and trickle it down so that it really mm -hmm. looks like what the world looks like. Women, and women are the creative of minds to this world I um, mean and, and when you have if you have women women gamers mm -hmm. uh, you need to have women you know facilitators women programmers women designers um, because when you are designing a game you have to get into that human conceptual mindset and be able to bring that to life so mm -hmm. the racial biases racial tension um, finances money um, in this industry, it, it, it costs a lot to have a team. So how can black people have access? How can we have venture capitalists invest in us so that we can have the same access that our counterpoints have? Um, and then just getting over the westernized mindset of this is negative. Um, we talk fear to others because we don't play the game or we mm -hmm. don't understand the game. So we're talking the fear to others. And we have to realize that we cannot talk fear into people that actually believe into something that we don't believe in. Um, so those are some negative condensations that really, really stick to me, um, that I really work hard to do the work. Uh, since there aren't a lot of women in this industry as well, particularly women of color, mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that my voice is heard for a lot of women. But I do that by showing up on gaming advisory boards and making sure that I'm speaking up for black women. Or, or women of color, um, but also women because it is a male-dominated industry. Yeah.
No, it 1000% is. And that's one thing, like re one reason in particular why I really wanted to have you on the show because I see all the amazing things that you do. And I'm very intentional about making sure that the voices that need to be heard are heard, especially when they're talking about the different benefits, things that society as a whole media doesn't really talk about, you know, so people who actually specialize and whatnot. So um, your name's Hip Hop Tech Diva. So, you know, we're going to get into the hip hop a little bit. And one thing I love is that I don't have my bamboo earrings on today. I feel so oh, good. It's that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, though. It's all good, though. One thing is, like, black culture in general takes over everything. You know, hip-hop is ran by black people. And when you look at how hip-hop see it seeps into everything, thing, culture, fashion, gaming, et cetera, like, I'm looking at now versus was something that started with the pandemic. And now they're starting no, to dip their toes. Oh, well, actually, no, no, it, it wasn't be before that. But the online thing of what we know, you know, that's when it really blew up. But now they're starting to dip their toe into gaming also. So when I think about gaming, I have some artists in mind. But like, who are some artists that you think about, hip hop artists in particular, when um, you think about gaming? Oh, OK. So so, OK, rewind. How are we looking at this? You can look at it from any perspective, really. Like, who is an artist, like, when you think about gaming um, in general? Like, oh, that comes to mind. So, say, for instance, for me, like, I know I look at T-Pain. He's very big within gaming. Okay. Um, he does stuff with Twitch. Uh, Vince Staples, he specifically says that he makes his music for different things to be used in. So, licensed with gaming, with with uh, movies, music, et cetera. Right, yeah. So, I, number one, look at... Um, People are gonna laugh at me. Soldier Boy, Soldier Boy, been hitting the market for a minute with the Soldier <laughs> Boy. He did anything. He invented gaming. He, he invented gaming. He has, he has been hitting the market really. Facts. I'm the first, like you know. Um, but then Offset. A lot of people don't know Offset is into gaming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one person, God, and it just slipped my mind because I just had him on my. Oh, Chief Keef. Chief Keef actually has his own esports team. Um, and so a lot of people don't know that about Chief Keep. So when I think of gaming, I look at those rappers. Um, and then I also just look at, you know, celebrities that have been involved in it. A lot of people don't know that Rick Fox was one of the first black investors in an esports team. And that's hmm. when I learned about the controversy of esports and black people from the lawsuit that went on with Rick Fox. Um, Expand more on that, please, because I haven't heard about that. So that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So when I was doing my research on esports back in 2018, so here in the States, esports has been around for a minute, um, but our mm -hmm. culture is just getting into it. And so one of the biggest, I, I was researching like blacks in esports and Rick Fox, the Lakers player, popped up, mm -hmm. um, former Lakers. And so if he was an investor. He had a team and Wanted a, it was a big racial spat going on about comments that the guy was making and Rick Fox sued him. Um, mm. And so that's when I learned about the real diversity issue that is involved in this gaming esports trajectory that is coming up. Um, so, yeah, those are the people that I think about it. There are new people that are dipping into it. Uh, like I said, Versus has their game side, so Swiss and Tim. Um, and whoever else has born into verses are now at that. And every mm. yo, remember Def Jam Vendetta? That was my shit. Like, <laughs> that was way ahead of the like when I think about gaming, when it comes to hip hop and gaming, that was way ahead of the curb. And they need to bring that back, but you know, I understand the politics yeah. of it though. Yeah. yeah, so I that was something that was very, very major for me because I was an intern at Jeff Jam at that time. So, okay, okay. Yeah, if they were Def Jam Vendetta back, but all rappers game, man. Everybody games. If you look at it, you got streetwear in it. You have Meek Mill has stuff on like 2K mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, Dr. Dre is now on GTA. So that's yep. the newest thing for me is Dr. Dre, Busta Rhymes, Anderson Pack, um, Snoop, them being embedded into this whole GTA. Uh, yeah fantasy world is really what matters to me right now when i think of hip-hop and gaming yeah now it's, it's definitely dope and seeing just for me i remember when i think about video games i think about like the madden uh soundtracks from back in the day nba 2k 
And that's what we're here, like the fire tracks and you playing the games. So I'm like, oh, shoot. So beginning that exposure really is dope. And I, I hope that it opens up a lot of avenues for independent artists to have their stuff on video games to kind of even have similar to like a streaming service where they're able to upload their stuff. So like a limited license to use their stuff on video games. Because when you look at GTA, Grand Theft Audio, for all y'all who don't know what that is, they have different radio stations and they have a ton of different music on there. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the possibilities when it comes to newer artists to get their stuff out there from exposure. Level, I definitely. Actually, there is actually my homeboy Turbo. He um, actually just did the first esports licensed uh, video game soundtrack album mm. um, he's here in L.A. And it's all it's like independent artists. I have to, he just posted it. It's him and Capcom. Mm. Um, and so it's there. Independent artists are actually getting seen. They're actually being played at the arenas. You know, the, the new gaming entertainment side is taking over. And I'm excited, so excited to see about that part of the industry. That's a beautiful thing. So touching upon, you know, people getting into the industry. So like, what are some like this a casual gamer, if they say, oh, yeah, this is something new, you know, Gene Han has inspired me to get into the field, right? So what are some ways that people can get into the esports industry just with what they have currently? So I always say this, bank on your personal skill set. Understand where you're unique at. Always mm -hmm. know what your skill is because your skill takes you far. Your gift that you were presented and has embedded in the universe has embedded into you. Know where it's at. Mm -hmm. um, be authentic. That's the number one rule. If you can't be authentic, you're not going to make it far um, because Facts. the people in this industry can really definitely understand who's here for what and who's not. Um, and understand that you do not have to be a gamer to be in this industry. Mm -hmm. I'm not a gamer. <laughs> like, yes, mm -hmm. I'll play some old school games or whatever, but understand that if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a fashion designer, a stage designer, makeup, um, hair, you have a spot in this industry. Network yourself, market yourself so that people understand who you are because this is not one of the entertainment sides where it's hard to meet people. No, you can meet a lot of people like me on Clubhouse, Twitter spaces, um, mm -hmm. but authentically be yourself, but know your special skill set that can take you. I knew that education can take me. I knew that me being a researcher and understanding my community and just my bounce around lifestyle um, could take me far because I have different types of skill sets and strategies that come along with Jihan. And so mm -hmm. I really want people to understand and sit with themselves that everything that every gift that you have with yourself is usable in every industry, specifically in this gaming industry, because it's just getting started. So, yeah. Facts. And I'm a big believer that your gifts will make room. You know, you may be nervous about it, but sometimes you just got to take that jump, make that leap for real, for real. And I'm definitely proof of that. You know, go back to the before this interview and you hear a little about my story of how I actually got into esports. Definitely. So um, we're going we gonna to wrap up a little bit. We're going to get there. But I got a very, very serious question for you. You know, sure. uh, all right. You from Philly. What is I the am. best cheesesteak spot? I got to ask listen, you. It's serious. It's serious out here. Listen. You know. What's going on? That is not a conversation. I will always tell people this. There uh -huh. are only two. There are, first of all, let's go where you're going to go. Because I listen. I'm I mean, trying to hear what you're going to say, you know. It's going to be D'Alessandro's is number one. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. D'Alessandro's, mm -hmm. Max's. I don't know right. where else. I was just waiting for Max's. You know, I was just waiting for Max's. Unless, right. unless, even though Max got a little, you know what I mean? They got a little buggy bugs, but I think they got that thing cleaned up. Protein, <laughs> protein, <laughs> protein, protein, you know? I don't go to Pat's. I don't go to Gino's. Yeah. That's that shit. Don't nobody mm -hmm. put cheese on their cheese steaks. Um, salt, pepper, ketchup. Facts. And that's it. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. I had to ask you, you know, you say Max is though, so you're good though. We, we right here with you, right here with it, you know. Delisandro's beats Max's any day because they from my hood. So. I got to try that then. I've never been there, but definitely. Got to. Matter of fact, yeah. I was just on Facebook. My homegirl, she just posted it. I was like, yo, don't nobody argue me down. Delisandro's, <laughs> period. Like nothing comes in between. So. All right, all right. And for y'all watching out there too, if you go to Max's, go during the day though. It's all good, you know. If you're not, you know, nah, you know. Go at, you know. Night. go at night if you want. <laughs> Like true North Philly <laughs> entertainment. Yeah, it's wild, but it's so all good though. Bring cash <laughs> on. 
<laughs> facts, facts. <laughs> All right, Jihan, it has been an absolutely pleasure to have you on here. The miseducation of people, salute, bless, you know. Um, so can you please tell the people where they can find you? Yes, yeah, slide in my DMs, like, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she said she's a single mom, so you know, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, it's, um, all right, so I got a couple. So I have Beat Bodics, which are, is my son and I's gaming awareness. So on Instagram and Twitter, I kept it all the same. It's Beat B-E-A-T-S, no, B-E-A-T, sorry, I really know how to spell, <laughs> underscore Botics, B-O-T-I-C-S. Uh, mm-hmm. Once again, it's beat, B-E-A-T, underscore Botics, B-O-I, B-O-T-I-C-S, sorry, it's a tongue twister. Um, yeah. And then I have my personal page, which is, uh, hold on, I got to actually look at it. So on Twitter, <laughs> it's pop. Hip hop ed tech, but I took the H off of tech. Um, okay. Diva, uh, and then on Instagram is hip hop ed tech, hip hop tech diva. So I- I'll send y'all the spelling so you can know it. <laughs> but uh, no worries. That's where you can find me <laughs> at. Um, but yeah, just hit me up. My website is launching January first, so that will be another way. It's going to be gianj.com um, for mm-hmm. you to keep up with my journey as a PhD researcher. Um, as a awareness and advocacy person and as an advisory board in gaming and esports for women and maybe soon collegiate universities. All right, all right. So you out here doing big things. You know, you put out in the universe. It will occur, definitely. It will. And we're going to... We're going to have all the information down below, too, so y'all can go ahead and connect with her and be Bonix and all the amazing stuff that she's doing out here. So, But, Jihan, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And, you know, hopefully we see you back around on the Real Talk Session Series or Miss Education to People. High frequency. Yes, let's have a talk about, listen, let's have a talk about Jay-Z or Nas. Oh, you want to add this on the episode right now? Right now? Nah, we can add it now. I'm going to give you time to do your history. So I'm saying, you know, I could do that right now. Yo, listen, we could do it. I'm a hip hop head. Listen, we could do it. Okay. Top. Let's have the episode of. This education. education.